development strategies um, for the professional development phase, but that's just because I'm working there at the moment. This is stuff that I've done probably all through um, all the places I've worked. Um, most recently, uh, before Forest, I was at um, Burnley for a bit. So um, the reason I kind of want to talk about this is we interviewed or we had, we staged interviews for an under 23s physical performance coach. And I felt like everyone had a really good handle on um, what they should be doing in the gym. Um, what I found where there were kind of holes in people's um, knowledge base was um, the stuff they should be doing on the grass. And there's probably not as much out there as what there is on, on gym based stuff. And it's also probably because I'm not an expert in SNC really. Um, so in terms of periodization and my influences, um, people I've kind of worked with and learned from over the years, been lucky enough at Wales to work with Ryland Morgans. Ry was um, head of performance at Liverpool, Liverpool for a period. He's been at Everton, he's been at Swansea for a while. Um, Adam Owen, again, another really um, experienced uh, practitioner who's gone into coaching um, and he linked that really well with the physical side of things as well. Um, Tony Strudwick, obviously, who was at uh, Man United, um, Strud's is at Wales now as well. Um, again, just kind of a different take on it to the two lads. The two lads were more a tactical periodization model, whereas Strud's is more focused on recovery and the general feel around the group and just getting, getting everyone kind of at it. And then kind of from a management point of view, uh, when I was at Burnley, like Sean Dyche was really clear in, in what he wanted physically from everyone. Like it didn't always fit, um, it didn't always fit probably what I would have preferred, but um, the gaffer was really clear and he, he placed a real high priority on the physical outputs as well. Um, so what I'm going to, to display is actually really different to what we did at Burnley, but I'll go through that as well. Uh, as I said, the reasoning for, for going through this is the staffing. So even, even the staff I had uh, or I have in place at, um, at Forest now, we're still kind of going through that journey of trying to explain to coaches and to performance staff um, what a week should look like or what a week could look like. And there's loads of different ways of doing it, as I said, but um, we have a set model. Again, coaches um, want to know and um, need to know, really. Um, I know it gets, it gets spoke about a little bit in, in coaching courses like your UEFA B and your UEFA A, but it doesn't really go into the detail with, with the do's and don'ts that, that you need to see. And when I first come in as well, like one of my first weeks, uh, like the 18s coach, this is going to sound like a, a bit of a battering on coaches as well, but it's not. It is a little bit, but um, I was asked, all right, what's, what's the high speed running target for today? And I'm like, well, like, what does it matter? And, and like, it, even when I did the interview, they were like, oh, we do big volume here. We do. And I'm like, all right. It's, it's like I, I was trying to tell them, well, actually, we, we can get players fitter if we just train properly and a bit more consistent in terms of um, our approach and more strategic in our approach rather than just chasing numbers, which is a real bugbear of mine. So I asked them. Um, I asked the interviewees, I said, right, if we had a one game week, show us what, um, what structure you would, you would want to look at. And I, I would have liked to have seen something like this. And I did actually see this because this is the work of the fellow we actually hired, Kieran Berry, who we got in from Swansea. Um, and this is kind of uh, an ideal, um, the ideal way um, I would map it out. So you've got your game at the end of the week, and then you've got your recovery um, plus one and plus two uh, after your game, obviously. So normally I would do as much of a muchness, but I would go, say if we play Saturday, Sunday's off, and then your Monday is a technical day. I'll go into it in more detail, but very low um, tempo, second day recovery. If you're working football, you'll be really familiar with it. Um, kind of bigger spaces, low tempo, low volume, all that. Um, the conditioning days then are your match day plus three minus four and your match day plus four minus three. Um, again, I'll go in in more detail, but your strength day is what we would call an intensive day. Um, we call it an intensive day at Burnley. We call it a strength day at Wales. Uh, it's more your small sided footy, um, axles, D cells, change of direction, that sort of thing. Your resistance day then was more your um, 
high speed running day, longer durations, try to hit the heart and lungs as well. Um, then you go into your taper. So um, obviously after kind of three days, what we decided to do at Forest was we actually took this day out altogether, the minus two. Um, and uh, then you'd go into your match prep day where um, it's literally um, really small uh, volume, really low duration, but still decent intensity, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail. But, so we've, we've got rid of this one at um, Forest. Um, but when I was at Burnley, we used to have a Wednesday off, which is that resistance day there. So what we ended up doing was we just squeeze this and this together and you'd get everything. So the session literally used to look like, right, we'll go out, we'll warm up, uh, we'll do a box, we'll do um, three V3s, we'll build up to four V4s, then we might do a bit of six V6, finish on nine V9. Um, and then there'd be conditioning runs in there, there'd be some high speed running, you'd get your max speed exposure and all that. And then we'd have Wednesday off and then you'd have a minus two, which was more of a tactical day. And then your match prep was a really sharp kind of razzle day that like it was the lads favorite day of the week because it was an enjoyable session, just getting them prepped for the game. Um, and yeah, another thing I'll kind of go into is uh, when to get your peak velocity in. Um, and I kind of flip flop on, on this all the time because probably from uh, a muscular point of view, you'd probably do it on your resistance day. But from an energy system point of view, you might do it on your strength day. Um, as well as that, you're also kind of a little bit fatigued from your strength day going into your resistance day. Um, so it might not be advisable to do your, your peak velocity work there, but that's kind of, they're kind of finer details within that. And it's a bit like, um, you know, I flip flop all the time and I, I, I won't kind of argue with anyone over it, whatever day they decide to put it on. Um, yeah, so this is uh, kind of what it looks like. I'll go into, I'll just uh, fire through this one um, and then I'll go into each day individually because I've kind of gone through all this stuff already. Um, as we said, technical day, you're more about movement quality and movement efficiency. Strength day, um, acceleration mechanics, deceleration mechanics, landing mechanics, uh, change of direction uh, variations. You're more linear then on your resistance day. Back to movement quality then on uh, your speed day, match prep then, you're more reactive. Uh, that is normally just within the warm up where you'll give them a little bit of a, a reactive day. And uh, I suppose it's important to note as well that like myself and Kieran have put this together. Um, Kieran's actually really big on, um, on the game speed model, Ian Jeffrey's game speed model, which is, um, it's kind of new to me as well in terms of recommended reading. I definitely recommend it. It's just about having, um, I'll go into it in a bit more detail, but it's about, about having a physical, technical and tactical consideration in, in all your work and all your physical work. So technical day, plus one, plus two, low intensity, larger spaces. I've got kind of do's and don'ts in for, uh, for the coaches. So, right. <laughs> The amount of times I've had a coach kind of say to me, right, we're on plus two, we've not got many numbers. Can we do 1v1s and crossing and finishing? And I said, no, we definitely can't do 1v1s and crossing and finishing because lads are still recovering because they've just played a game and we don't want them twatting balls around. So do phases of play, extensive passing, tactical wall throughs, technical drills, big possession if you want, IDP or we, we call them uh, ILPs, just the individual learning plans for the for the um, 18s and 23s, avoid those days. Don't do pressing, don't do shooting, don't do small sided games. Avoid tackles, blocks, change of directions and contacts and stuff like that. So try and keep it as tranquilo as you can for, for those kind of days. Again, it's just about, still in the recovery phase, it's just about getting out, getting moving um, and hopefully accelerate recovery a little bit. Our strength and intensive sessions, again, conditioning phase, really high intensity, moderate session volume. We probably do quite large volumes on our, um, on our strength days at, at Forest at the moment. Um, as I said, when I first come in, they were big on volume. They were, you know, it wouldn't be unusual for them to do two 10K days on the bounce. I'm trying to get them away from that now. Um, and let's kind of focus on the intensity of it. So smaller, smaller spaces, 1v1s, 2v2s. 
um, shoot and transitions, tackles, blocks, um, avoid your long durations, high speed running and sprint distance volume. Uh, by all means, if you want to do a peak speed exposure or if you get it within the football, it's not a problem. But the main focus of the day is uh, accelerating and decelerating. Um, in terms of work to rest ratio, you want to keep it really high because you want the lads to um, reproduce accelerations, decelerations, change of directions within a 3v3 or a 4v4, for example. But um, you want to give them enough rest so they can do it again. We're, we're, we want to maintain kind of high quality throughout all the small sides. Resistance session, again, we're looking at bigger volume, longer durations, 8v8, 11v11, uh, directional, non-directional possessions, overlaps, recovery runs, all that sort of thing. Avoid 1v1s and 5v5s. Now, the problem for us, and like, we get this wrong all the time at work because it's like, um, what happens is the first team will take five players so then we're, we're left with five and all of a sudden we've done an intensive day yesterday and now we've got to do a bigger space session with four players so it does get difficult and you do kind of have to um, take the rough with the smooth a little bit but if you again this one your work to rest ratio you can go one to one to one one to two one to point five really stretch them heart and lungs wise get them that um, aerobic stimulus as well if you can uh, speed day again. We've uh, we don't do this at Forest at the moment. I mean, we do on occasion because fixtures change a lot, and depending on the previous game ones, we do quite frequently have a minus two. But again, if if I had to choose, and again coming back to the weekly plan, I'd always opt to have two working days in there. And if you want to lose one of your taper days, I don't think that's much of a problem. Um, yeah, again, so what we're doing here is we're increasing the work to rest ratio. We're probably shortening the distances a little bit. So the intensity is still high, but they get more rest and they're traveling shorter distances with it. So they're not accelerating as much. They're not decelerating as hard. Um, and they get loads of rest in between as well. And then the match prep day, the minus one. Um, the one we used to do at Burnley you used to be able to like set your watch by it so you'd go uh, warm up transfer box crossing and finishing 6v6 with six edge men on the outside and then a little bit of tactical literally just a five minute tactical chat set pieces and then they were done um, at Wales we've done it where um, we've had kind of a uh, a kind of tactical walkthrough as well. Again, really low tempo, work to rest like one to six. Again, just keeping that, um, keeping that freshness in the lads if you can. Uh, one of the biggest problems we probably had with the lads at Burnley was getting them in because they'd want to stay out shooting um, for half an hour after the session when you need to get them in because they need to keep that in their legs. Uh, additional layers within that. Um, as I said, Kieran's big on his game speed model, so the physical specificity of it, the technical specificity, tactical, and then I'm big on player engagement as well, which I'll go into. But the idea being, if we're doing an intensive day and the focus of the day from a coaching point of view or a technical point of view is pressing, Kieran will do his normal warm-up. He likes to do a lot of kind of uh, drop steps, movement competency stuff. Um, drop steps and cross steps and, and stuff like that. He'll then finish with a technical one where he splits them into attackers and defenders. The attackers are going to press and then the defenders are, or sorry, the defenders are going to press. The attackers are going to try to get away from him. And depending on, on the tactical element, uh, they might need to show him away from a certain area of the pitch. So Kieran will set that up where you're actually shielding. So it's a decent game where the lads get engagement. Technically, it fits in with the rest of the session because we're going to be doing a pressing session. And then from a tactical point of view, you're showing them away from the goal or you're showing them away from the middle of the pitch or whatever. And that's kind of, I mean, we're still really, really early days in this and that we're, we're going to do a CPD um, at, either at the end of the season or pre-season with the rest of the staff and the, the younger YDP staff and the 18 staff just kind of going through all this because I think it's... it's um, it's definitely improved, improved just the, the way the session flows for the 23s anyway. Um, the conditioning as well, which I'll go into in a bit more detail on the next slide. 
um, obviously dependent on, on what match day you're on or what game day you're on. The ones in general we use, um, I like the maximal aerobic speed stuff or the anaerobic speed reserve stuff. Uh, the tempo running, um, which is the, the Charlie Francis stuff. Um, peak speed exposures obviously are like so important. And when I started originally, the, the research on peak speed exposures probably wasn't out there. So they're not really included in, in, uh, in the periodization model, which is why I sometimes flip flop between doing them on a strength or doing them on a resistance day. And then just the intensive conditioning for your strength days. We've got a couple of kind of bankers in terms of um, different pressing drills and stuff that we like to do um, just for that intensive one. Cause it is, it is harder to kind of quantify because the metrics probably aren't, aren't quite there yet to the level um, high speed running and sprint distance are. In terms of the uh, gym stuff again, <clears throat> that's also match day dependent. So your intensive or your strength day on the grass um, links quite nicely to the, the power day in the gym. Um, and then your extensive uh, or resistance day, that, that links to more posterior chain stuff and maybe your, your heavier strength day. Um, and then obviously recovery days, we'll, we'll get our uppers in on those days. I mean, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. That's just how, how we've been doing it, really. Um, and then, oh, yeah, here we go. Conditioning strategy. So uh, MAS, the reason why we use MAS is it correlates quite nicely to VO2 max. It's easy to test. We do um, a Bronco with the lads, which is a 20, 40, 60 shuttle five times for time. Um, the Fitzpatrick paper um, that they did up at Newcastle found that if you spend roughly eight minutes above um, above uh, MAS, you probably are well. You're less likely to see a decrement in aerobic fitness or in time trial performance. And then, like using like just by having maximal aerobic speed, you can then set up a massive variety of drills based off. Um, so I'm Mladen Jovanovic's stuff and the spreadsheets he has. Um, so that's quite useful, particularly for our off-season conditioning because we use a lot of them um, with the lads in off-season and we've had fairly good, um, fairly good success with it. Um, tempo running we do as well. Um, again, high quality, high speed running. So it's a full pitch length in roughly about 15 seconds. Sorry, 16 seconds. Um, easy to implement, low CNS, um, the boys like it from, from what I've seen um, and they're not really fatiguing. So like we've used it to get a huge amount of high speed running, build a huge chronic load of high speed running. Um, and like the, the lads seem like able to tolerate it. Um, they've not really had any doms from it. We've built it up, obviously we built it up and Obviously, it's, it's different sports and, and stuff like that, but I think we started off with two threes, built it up to, uh, I think we ended up doing two sixes, which is like a huge volume of um, high speed running. And we've done that on a minus two and, and not had any problems and touch wood, no, um, no hammy injuries. Um, but as I said, it's easy to implement. The players like it um, and it's really good quality high speed running. Um, obviously, peak speed reduces in injury risk. Um, you get proper hamstring uh, activation from it, prepares players for worst case scenarios. And then as well as that, most of your key moments within a game are preceded by a sprint. Um, again, from, from our intensive conditioning point of view, um, it's about accelerating and decelerating properly. Again, moving back to care and stuff, the movement quality. Um, repeated uh, high intensity effort. So what, what we tend to do is we do drills like uh, a broken nine or a broken six even, where it's just pressing every cone and back for time. Um, I quite like doing mass variations as well, where you just put a load of shuttles in. Again, I'm not, um, it's, it's a harder one to quantify, but I think um, for our strength days, that sort of stuff kind of fits in well with the stuff on the grass, with the um, coaching stuff. Um, and I think that is it.
questions for Ronan? Ronan, um, I'm a cycling coach, and I was just interested in what you're saying about MAS here and the eight minutes above. I just want to check, I understood what you said there. The eight minutes above, you said, was to maintain aerobic fitness, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and that's eight minutes above what? Uh, so what, whatever the individual's maximum aerobic speed is. So if you, I can send you the Fitzpatrick paper, but it's, um, they've done, I think they did a five minute time trial in it. Um, and basically found that the players who spent eight minutes or above their threshold, which for our lads is about 4.5 meters per second. Um, uh, they didn't like their performance in the time trial didn't get worse. Whereas lads who spent a bit less did have a poorer performance in the time trial. So you would, you could maintain their their aerobic fitness just by using blocks of this. And how many times would you do? Is this once a week, eight minutes above typically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, you wouldn't do it all in one hit. It's the so the weekly load would be awesome. would be eight minutes. But like we've had it, our under 18s like I've been doing like 16 minutes in that. Like it's. Um, big volumes and and like it's um it's easy to get because it's not particularly fast like the conditioning blocks we do are a little bit quicker than that but i am um, i think it yeah so when, when we were talking about big volumes and when i went in at forest they were saying oh we do big volumes here and i'm like well I, i'm pretty sure we can we can keep them fitter without doing huge amounts of volume um but yeah, it's definitely worth looking into because we've had big success with it, particularly like during lockdown and COVID and that um, with the lads at Burnley. We, we, all our stuff was based around MAS and, and the lads came back in a really good place. I'll well, certainly have a look at that. You know, I, I would normally coach the U2 max with three minute intervals. Yeah. You know, maybe you know, reducing the, the recovery in between, but starting maybe three, three and three or three and yeah. two and coming back. But I'll do six sets of those yeah. in a session. It was quite, quite different. Yeah, yeah. Roots, obviously. Just, yeah. Okay, thanks. Nice. Um, I had a question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Sorry for that. So, uh, obviously, uh, thank you very much for the presentation, first point, was brilliant. And uh, I, I can see that you use a lot of small side game, medium side game, and large side game for your training. And uh, this is fantastic. From a scientific point of view, we know that uh, you can achieve, for example, high heart rate, RP, lactate, or also uh, activation of the with this type of format. But sometimes uh, we struggle for the high speed side. So high speed running, sprinting distance, especially during small side game, uh, sometimes also during large side game. Yeah. Well, how can you implement uh, this type of uh, program with uh, exercise or drills uh, without uh, the ball, I could say, yeah. uh, if you do that frequently, for example, and uh, what you think about uh, the use of large set game to achieve high speed running and sprinting uh, is something that uh, you see is difficult or with your player you achieve that uh, regularly? Yeah, we, we thought when we were doing rehabs, um, me and Tom Shaw, who I used to work with quite closely, um, we used to almost always box off our high speed running with isolated drills. Now we'd have, and then we thought, right, well, we were having, we, we were having some re-injury. So we thought maybe we're not doing enough functional stuff. So like, then we started introducing more stuff with the ball and it's obviously it's, it's less um, precise, but you can still do it. So as long as you get your sets and reps right, like we, we do a real good, um, crossing and finishing one at the moment, but like you literally just need huge pitch sizes rather than small sided games, more probably position specific drills where you're getting wingers, um, essentially keeper gets it, diag out to the winger, winger overlaps and then recovers back in. Um, and then trying to find similar ones for center halves, for, for center mids and everything else like that. So we've done it that way and that's, that's quite good because sometimes it's, it's easier to do that than to um, get the lads on the line and run. Because sometimes from a psychological point of view, you're just like, actually, let, let's not run them today, let's do this. Um, it's less controllable, but you, there's other benefits to it. So we've done that as well, yeah.